Hare Krishna devotees, welcome to our Gita Jayanti special. So today we will be doing a quick review of chapter 16, which we completed yesterday uh, with uh, many more pastimes and uh, probably a closer look at um, the qualities that the Lord talks about <clears throat> of the people who are, um, who are uh, divine in nature. And then we will move to chapter 17, which is uh, titled Shraddha Traya Vibhaga Yoga, the divisions of faith. So in chapter 16, which is called Daivashura Sampad Vibhaga Yoga, it's essentially uh, contrasting divine qualities with demoniac qualities. And essentially, Krishna is saying that if we develop divine qualities, then we will be elevated to the higher places on that upside down banyan tree. But if we imbibe demonic qualities, then we're going to go in the opposite direction uh, on that upside down banyan tree and we'll eventually go to lower species of life. So Krishna describes the qualities of a person who is divine and those who are considered demoniac. Overall, there are 26 divine qualities, but those qualities are actually split up by the Varna. So when we open that shloka, we will look at uh, the qualities split by Varnas. So not all qualities belong to everybody. Some qualities, Krishna is talking about um, the Brahmanas, then some qualities possessed by the Kshatriyas, etc. So we take a closer look at that. Then Krishna also talks about the six demoniac qualities. And if you possess these six demoniac qualities or any one or more of them, then the possibility of liberation um, diminishes. Um, only bondage uh, will continue if you nurture, feed, and maintain this demonic qualities. We talked about how different yugas <clears throat> had these divine and demonic qualities split up either between planetary systems or within the same planet or within the same family and finally within the same person here in Kali Yuga. And um, the fact that we also possess demonic qualities is that on the extreme side, People want to reject God. They want to take God out of the picture. Because if they think God is out of the picture, then they can lord it over material nature. They can gain power, wealth, etc. Not recognizing out of their own ignorance and foolishness and uh, degraded consciousness that ultimately all of that has to come to an end at the end of this life. Um, in our classrooms today, we really don't teach um, scriptures to bring about a balance in the curriculum. Our curriculum is heavily favored towards uh, material subjects. Um, therefore, even in our curriculum in schools and colleges, maybe with a few exceptions, maybe there are certain schools that do focus on spirituality and teach spirituality. But generally, at least in India, uh, the schools don't focus on spirituality. So they are essentially taking God out of the picture. Our education is complete, incomplete when you're only educated on all things related to matter and nothing related to spirit. So education system can only, only be complete, as Krishna himself says in the Bhagavad Gita, when you know both about Prakriti Jivatma and Paramatma. So both matter and spirit together constitutes a balanced and complete education. So one day a young girl asks her father, you know, where do we where do you where do we come from? And her father, being a bit of a scientist, says, you know, we have all descended from apes. You know, I'm sure. My dear daughter, you would, have, you would have read about the Darwin theory in school that suggests that uh, we have 
you know, the higher species have come from lower species that have developed over a period of time, that have changed over a period of time. So she goes to her mother and she asks the same question. Where do we come from? And her mother says, we come from God. So now she's confused. The father is saying, we come from apes. Mother is saying, we come from God. So she asks her mother, why are you giving, why are both of you not consistent in the answer? Shouldn't it be one answer? How can the answers be contradictory? To which her mother says, yes, yes. You know, your father's side of the family has come from apes. My side of the family comes from God. So even there, there is a bifurcation <laughs> for the child. We end up confusing the child. So it's evolution that is taught in schools today. <clears throat> and it is taught as the sole truth. Um, so Darwinism suggests that there is no God, there is no role of the divine. Although Darwin himself, there is a quote from Darwin about the um, um, the design of our eyes, you know, how beautifully it's constructed. So he does indicate that there must be a God present, but for any way, for whatever reason, for this basic, for the, um, for the purposes of science, he propagates this theory of evolution. So the evolution theory suggests that uh, um, that higher species have evolved from lower species. Whereas if you read the scriptures, the scriptures clearly say that all species existed. Um, at the time of creation. <clears throat> yes, evolution may happen. I mean, we may undergo changes of the body. But actually, what our scriptures teach is evolution of the soul. The soul is only migrating from one body to another. Um, it's not evolution of the body. It's actually evolution of the soul. So Prabhupada says that those who believe that we have come from monkeys, they are still monkeys. Because they believe that the world has come by chance, <clears throat> that a big bang produced all of this cosmos. But they're not able to explain from where this big bang actually occurred. Who was responsible for the big bang? How did the big bang happen on its own? So essentially, if the, the natural conclusion you will draw is life has no purpose because everything is an accident. So everything is ultimately meaningless. If everything is an accident, then nothing is meaningful at all. So Lord Krishna says here that such demoniac people who have, who carry such belief systems, they cause immeasurable problems for themselves and also for society. So if you follow the Vedas, you will acquire divine qualities. If you disregard the Vedas, then you are drowning in demoniac qualities. So who do you actually associate with so that you can develop your divine qualities and subdue your demoniac qualities? So since chapter 16 was titled as Inmates, if you associate or if you nourish the demoniac, then your prison sentence is extended. in the sense that you have many more births that you've committed yourself to. <clears throat> and every human birth or every birth in this material cosmos is considered a jail sentence. So if you hang out with the wrong crowd or if you nourish the baser desires, then you are essentially extending your own prison sentence and Krishna says that's quite foolish, it's not very intelligent. So our objective, Krishna says, should be to develop those divine qualities. So most of the shlokas are about demoniac qualities in chapter 16. And um, we look at the uh, 
divine qualities here. So let me just pull up <clears throat> the shloka. So Krishna is uh, enumerating the 26 divine qualities in uh, shlokas uh, 1 to 3. Let's take a closer look at this. So the trajectory of this chapter is that shlokas 1 to 3, uh, Krishna talks about the divine qualities. Shlokas 4 to 9, Krishna talks about the demoniac qualities. Shlokas 10 to 18, Krishna talks about the consequences of such demoniac activities. And then Krishna talks about, towards the end of the chapter, the last two shlokas, he's giving us a choice. Divinity or demonism. That's our choice. And uh, therefore, is it that red pill or the blue pill? Which do you want to take? Um, so let's look at uh, these divine qualities from the point of view of um, uh, varnas. <clears throat> so there are four varnas, as we know. So the varnas, although in our culture we call it the caste system, it is actually a class system whether you're a first class man or second class man or third class or fourth class. This doesn't mean that any one class is superior to the other. It simply means that the four classes have to work in cooperation with each other to satisfy the Supreme Lord. So when the Lord talks about the study of the Vedas, the performance of sacrifice, self-control, simplicity, non-violence, and truthfulness. Krishna is essentially talking about the qualities that a Brahmana must possess. Arjavam, simplicity. Ahimsa, satyam. So these are all qualities that a Brahmana must possess. So in this 26 shlokas, uh, sorry, in the 26 qualities, all four varnas are uh, actually covered. Krishna also talks about, um, for example, <clears throat> as far as the labor class goes, they should not have any expectation to be honored. So they should also be free from envy. So typically, it's only human nature that if we find people around us who seem to be more intelligent, more successful, more wealthy than us, um, it may generate feelings of envy. So Krishna is saying, if you are part of the labor class, to avoid this kind of feelings, or attitudes. Cleanliness and everything has to do with the Vaishyas. Kshatriyas have to learn how to forgive. Um, they must have compassion for all living entities because they are the king of not just human beings, they are also kings of all of the Jivatmas that reside in their kingdom. So <clears throat> these varnas are assen essentially fashioned by these various qualities. So different varnas, we have to um, nourish different qualities in order to be accepted as a prominent. I was listening to a lecture a couple of days ago. You know, in our culture, generally there is a mis conception about the Varnas. That if you are born into a Brahmin family, you consider yourself a Brahmana. If you are born into a Vaishya family, you consider yourself a Vaishya. But Krishna says that's not true. That's not how he has structured the system at all. Now, typically in Vedic culture, if you are a Brahmana, 
then you trained your children on Brahmanical qualities. So it's only after training can they be called a Brahmana themselves. Similarly, a Kshatriya will train their children to govern, to rule, to fight, how to manage an army, how to engage in politics, etc. So your Varna comes as a result of your training and the kind of work that you are naturally inclined to do. So one person approached a senior devotee in his gone and said, oh, do you know I'm a Brahmana? You know, many, many, many generations we come down in this Brahmanical culture. Obviously, we know now today that Brahmanas are almost non-existent because Brahmanas are not supposed to work for a living. They depend on charity. If Brahmanas have to ask for money for services that they provide, then they're not considered Brahmanas. They're actually doing business. So <clears throat> how do all of these qualities vary and when can and can these qualities also change over a period of time? Yes, it can. And the past, there is a pastime about this. So, um, in the Dandakaranya forest, when Lord Ram and Sita Devi and Lakshmanji were living their 14 years of exile, it is said that Mother Sita would walk in the front and remove the thorns so that her Lord did not have to step on them. And she asks Lord Ram, you know, you have given up your kingdom. Why do you still hold on to the bow? Because um, a Kshatriya has to fight. It's just his nature to fight. But since we are in exile, I see you carrying around your bow and arrow. What's the necessity for it? So the Lord says, you know, I am a Kshatriya. My nature compels me, my nature travels with me, and therefore my duty is to defeat the demons wherever I find them. If I find the demons in the forest, I still have to defeat them. Just because I don't have a kingdom doesn't mean that my nature has changed. So hearing this, Mother Sita tells Lord Ram a story. She says, many years ago, there was a Brahmana who had accumulated so many pious credits that was sufficient for him to take on the next, uh, to take on the role of Indra. Essentially, he could dislodge the current Indra simply based on the um, accumulation of pious credits. And sure enough, the current Indra felt threatened. And he thought, let me do something about it because if I allow this Brahmana to continue with his practices, he will replace me. So see, even among demigods, sometimes they exhibit these qualities of fear, restlessness, and uh, attachment to title, positions of power, etc. So one day, Indra in disguise goes to the Brahmana and gives him a sword and tells him, keep it safely. When I am back from my journey, I will pick it up from you. So I'm going on a mission. I'll come back in a little bit of a time. The Brahmana says, okay. So Indra is just now playing a waiting game. He has to wait and see what happens. Will the Brahmana fall for the temptation of having a sword in the house? <clears throat> so the first day, the Brahmana looks at the sword. It's very shiny. It's beautiful. Um, it looks too tempting. The second day, he picks it up in his hand and he's admiring the sword. The third day, he tries out some moves with the sword. 
and pretty soon like this he got attached to the sword so indra was successful in his mission the brahmana because of um feeding and nourishing the qualities um that were not brahmanical was no longer no longer a brahman so essentially his pious credits would now have been diminished because of his sudden attachment for the instrument so much so he lost his brahmanical qualities so it is possible that your qualities may change depending on the association so we said there are three ways in which you acquire these qualities nature nurture and culture nature means by birth abhijatasya krishna says there are certain qualities you are born with then there are certain qualities that you nurture and these qualities that you nurture is going to shape your destiny and then there is certain qualities you acquire through association with others in your environment in your surroundings overall this nature nurture and culture um shapes your personality so it is said that the cow is considered to be in the mode of goodness the tiger is considered to be in the mode of passion the monkeys are considered to be in the mode of ignorance so when a cow dies its next birth it will be a human being one of the reasons why um in our culture we are not supposed to kill cows is because of this of course the cow gives us milk so how can you kill the mother who's protecting you and taking care of your young ones so now after the war lord ram kills ravana and he sends hanuman to bring sita and hanuman goes to the shoka vatika and he looks at the rakshasis and he asks mother sita i know these rakshasis have been mistreating you do i have your permission to punish them because after all they had been troubling mother sita for a year so in response to hanuman ji's question mother sita tells him a story essentially indicating that we have to hold on to the qualities that we believe in that we value that our conduct should not change because of how we were treated or how somebody else was treated so one day a hunter goes to hunt a tiger so he's got his weapons with him and the tiger sensing the hunter's presence the tiger begins to chase the hunter the hunter out of fear trips and falls he loses his weapons and uh, being quick witted he climbs onto a tree but as he's climbing a tree he sees that a bear is occupying one of the branches and the bear is sleeping on the tree meanwhile the tiger was circling the tree the bear wakes up wondering what is all this commotion about and the tiger tells the bear you know we are both wild animals we are animals of this forest here we have an intruder in our midst this human being why don't you just push him down and both of us can have him as our me to which the bear says being noble in character this is my residence this tree if somebody has taken shelter in my residence then i have to provide them protection so i cannot do what you're asking so i cannot harm this human being even though he may be an intruder in the forest so now the tiger appeals to the hunter the bear goes back to sleep 
and the tiger tells the hunter, why don't you push the bear down? I am very hungry. I need to satisfy my hunger. Once I've satisfied my hunger, then you're free. Your life is protected. So the hunter being um, of low consciousness tries to dislodge the sleeping bear from the branch. Much to his dismay, the bear lands on a lower branch and survives. So now the tiger tells the bear, see, I told you, you can't trust this intruder. He double-crossed you now. Although you protected him, he had no hesitation to get rid of you. So the bear tells the tiger, I can't change my nature just because the hunter has done something wrong. That doesn't mean I should change my nature. So Mother Sita's point was that, you know, although they may have tortured me for a year, you know, I could have given it back in return to them, but it's not my nature to harm them. Therefore, Hanumanji, you cannot follow through with what you want to do. You cannot punish them for what they have done to me. So, <clears throat> um, so let's look at this. Actually, the shloka contains uh, varna and ashrama, right? The four varnas and the four ashrams. So what are the qualities that a sannyasi possesses? Fearlessness, purification of one's existence, cultivation of spiritual knowledge. What does the grahastha have to um, inculcate in them? Charity, self-control, and performance of sacrifices. What does a brahmachari have to um, practice? Both the study of the Vedas and, uh, yeah, study of the Vedas, Swadhyaya is the term that is used here in the shloka. What about the vanaprastas? They have to learn to perform austerity and lead a simple, non-violent and truthful life. Yeah. So similarly, the varnas that we spoke about. So both the varnas and ashramas, what qualities should they propagate within themselves is what the Lord is speaking about here. So then Krishna talks about the demoniac qualities like pride, arrogance, conceit, anger, harshness, and ignorance. And Krishna says all these qualities belong to those who are demoniac in nature. So one example of this harshness, um, the ability to um, finding faults, Krishna says aversion to fault finding should be a necessary quality in us, but the demons don't care for this. So there is an interesting pastime from our scriptures on this. So once a king was giving in charity some food, Annadan, and at that time, when the Sanadan was being served to the needy and those who wanted this nourishment, an eagle happened to be flying overhead uh, with a dead snake in its mouth. Now, drops of poison from the snake's mouth happened to fall into the food and the king, not being aware of it, um, the portion of the food with the poison was actually served to one of the brahmanas and the brahmana dies. Now, generally in our culture, it is said that the king is responsible for the death of his citizens. The king's role is to protect his citizens. So even if one citizen dies in the kingdom, the king has to take responsibility for that death in the sense that he partakes of that karma. Now, the problem was that the king, this was an unintentional thing. It happened. Things could not be controlled. There are certain things that are not in the control of the king. So he was quite sad and he was consulting with his um, Brahmins how to, you know, avoid this dosha of Brahmanhatya. 
the sin of killing a brahmana. So meantime, <clears throat> in Yamaloka, Chitragupta is maintaining account of who all had done what. And uh, because the payout has to come sooner or later. So he writes down the details of what had happened, but then he doesn't know who he should attribute this karma to, the untimely death of the Brahmana. The king was not at fault. Um, how could he control an eagle flying overhead? The eagle was not at fault. It was eating its food that is natural to it. A snake was also not at fault. It was anyway dead. So the snake was not alive. So he puts it in a file saying, to be de determined who's going to get the karmic reactions of the death of this Brahmana, TBD. And he waits to see. Meantime, a group of travelers reach the kingdom and uh, they are looking for the palace. They approach an old lady and they ask her, can you give us the directions to get to the palace? And the lady, old woman, obliges and tells them, this is the direction you need to go in. And at that time, she adds another statement. On top of giving direction, she says, do you know this king killed a brahmana recently? So essentially, what has she done? She has... Uh, poisoned their mind with this thought that the king was a killer of Brahman. Therefore, Chitragupta decided, yes, it's this old woman who deserves the consequences and who should accept the karma. Now you may say, wow, that is not fair. She criticized the king, but she didn't physically kill that Brahman. But since she did some character assassination here, she was given the um, punishment for the killing of that Brahmana. Actually, our Shastras say that karma operates differently in different yugas and karma also operates differently based on the Varna. So let us look at another example. Um, in the Mahabharata also, there is a story of a Brahmana being killed and four people were involved in that killing, one from each Varna. So a Brahmana, a Kshatriya, a Vaishya and a Shudra were all four involved in the killing of that Brahmana. So <clears throat> Vidura, calls the two crown princes, Duryodhan and Yudhishthir, and he asks them, how would you resolve this case? Who would you give the punishment to? So Duryodhan says, kill all four of them, because after all, all four of them were involved with the killing, and all four deserve the punishment. Vidura next asks Yudhishthir, what's your opinion? How would you... Uh, resolve this case, who would you punish? So Yudhishthir asks each of the four men, what is your varna? When the Shudra says he's of labor caste class, he lets him go away. He says he's just a servant who was following instructions. For the Vaishya, he jails the Vaishya and uh, he finds him. And uh, <clears throat> the Brahmana gets the most severe punishment. Why? Because the Brahmana ought to know better. He cannot call himself a Brahmana if he is uh, running around killing um, other Jivatmas. So, because Brahmanas are considered to be the head of society, they are the intellectual class, the intellectual class, as the Lord says, they should be engaged in the study of the scriptures. So after studying the scriptures, if you still violate the law, then you have the most severe punishment. 
We'll also come to another fascinating point here, how the scriptures operate differently. His Grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu says that the more advanced your consciousness is, and if you violate the scripture, then the punishment is more severe. So that means even the scriptures don't uh, look upon everything in a uniform manner. So the cause and effect, the punishment, the reward is all quite dynamic actually. So the more elevated you are, that means if you're a devotee and if you violate uh, the laws of the land or the laws of the Lord, then the punishment is much more severe because the expectation is you studied, you ought to know better and not fall down in such a manner. So there's also a pastime from um, <clears throat> Srimad Bhagavatam there is a king called King Riga. Um, so one day, I mean, the kings normally give in charity to the brahmanas, a lot of cows, and, um, jewelry, etc. So this king, King Riga, had given a cow in charity to one brahmana. Somehow, the cow escaped that brahmana's fields and came back into the king's supply of cows. So that same cow was given in charity to another brahmana. Which means the shastras say that the king should not uh, re-gift Something that he has already gifted, if it returns back to him, he should not re-gift. He should know better. Especially towards brahmanas, he is not supposed to do this. So, the brahmana was searching for his cow. The brahmana who lost the cow was searching for his cow. And he eventually finds it in this um, other brahmana's property. So, he goes to King Riga. And he demands that the king return his cow to him that he had gifted him first. So King Riga approaches the other brahmana, who, the second brahmana who was gifted the same cow, and he pleads with him and he says, you know, somehow or the other I made this mistake. I re-gifted this cow not knowing that this cow had already been gifted by me to that first Brahmana. So he said, I will give you hundreds of cows to replace this one cow so that I can give it back to the original owner of it, which is the Brahmana. So the second Brahmana declines. He said, no, 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 I'm not going to give up that cow. That cow is a very wonderful cow. It gives a lot of milk and very sweet natured, etc. You gifted the cow to me. I could care less. I'm not going to return the cow. So then King Riga goes to the first Brahmana and tells him, would you be so kind? I'm not able to get your cow back to you. I will give you 100,000 cows in exchange for that one cow that you lost. Kindly consider this offer from my side. So the first Brahmana was furious and he curses the king. So even though the king was ready to offer him thousands of more cows and additional charity, the original brahmana was refusing to accept the king's offer. So what does the original brahmana do? He's so furious. He curses King Indriga to come back as a lizard in his next life. So... <clears throat> come to Dwapar Yuga. So the king had uh, become this lizard or chameleon. And one day the Gopa boys were playing in the field 
and they came across an old well it was surrounded by overgrowth so they cleared the overgrowth and they knew that the well water would be very sweet so they leaned down to get some water and much to their surprise they see a chameleon a chameleon the size of a huge hill and the chameleon sought some help and the boys were not able to get the lizard out of the well and so they call for krishna and when krishna approaches the well this chameleon speaks to krishna and tells him about who he was in his past life that he was king riga reincarnated as a lizard and how he was a dharmic king he had done so many sacrifices and he said but somehow or the other i made this one mistake and because of that one mistake i was cursed by this brahmana and so he begs the lord to kindly release him from this curse of being in a lizard's body so the lord puts his lotus feet on this lizard and uh, the king goes back to the spiritual world so karma what i am saying is actually works in different ways in different yugas different varnas different ashramas it works very differently so essentially krishna is saying our goal should be to develop divine qualities sometimes even by accident we may do something erroneous depending on the yuga and what varna or ashrama we occupy and or whether we consider ourselves a devotee the repercussions will be as per what the lord decides so essentially we have to develop good qualities and although the lord says here in this chapter that those who do not develop good qualities you know i perpetually put them into hellish lives and they become more and more demoniac in nature however in our shastra there is no concept of hell being permanent you can also come out of hellish life although it's going to be difficult but punishments are temporary once you have undergone that punishment then the lord gives you another chance so in this chapter krishna says there are three gates to hell lust anger and greed and when lust is not fulfilled it leads to anger when lust is fulfilled it leads to greed so ultimately the culprit is lust as the lord had said already in chapter 3 so there are many many options for us here so krishna is saying i am trying to look at that shloka here where he says what is the point of all of this uh because they will not achieve any perfection uh they will not have any happiness and they will not re- reach the supreme destination so krishna uses the terms na siddhi na sukham na parangatim so those who engage in these extreme demoniac nature krishna says they will achieve no perfection they will achieve no happiness and they will not achieve the supreme destination yeah this is the shloka no this is the one this particular shloka krishna says yashastra vidhim utsrijya vartate kama karatah nasa siddhim avapnoti na sukham na parangatim krishna is saying he who discards scriptural injunctions and acts according to his own whims attains neither perfection nor happiness nor the supreme destination so what is the connection between chapter 16 and chapter 17 in chapter 17 arjuna asks an important question 
Now, Krishna has talked about those who have divine qualities and those who have demoniac qualities. Now, Arjuna says, um, what is the situation of those who do not follow the principles of scripture but worship according to their own imagination? Are they in goodness, in passion, or in ignorance? So we said there are two extremes, huh? divine qualities and demoniac qualities. What about those who fall in between? And they neither follow the scriptures fully, nor are they fully rejecting the scriptures. They do half-half. Certain things they follow, certain things they don't follow. So Arjuna wants to know, what guna are they in? What's predominating them? So Krishna is going to say, that their faith itself is going to be influenced by these three gunas. So that will be the topic for today. Shraddha Traya Vibhaga Yogaha. How the three gunas influence your faith. Before we begin, let's offer our humble obeisances to His Divine Grace. A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So today's acronym is FACE. So Krishna is going to talk about faith, the kind of austerities that one performs when we are neither following the scriptures nor disregarding the scriptures, but under the influence of the three modes, what kind of austerities we perform, what kind of charities we perform, and what kind of um, sacrifices we perform, what kind of worship we perform. Krishna is going to talk about all of this in the context of these three gunas. And Krishna is going to come back to the theme of how ultimately he is the enjoyer of everything. He said that in chapter 5. He said that in chapter 15. And he is going to say that again here. So what does the Lord say in response to Arjuna's question? According to the modes of nature acquired by the embodied soul, one's faith can be of three kinds. In goodness, in passion, or in ignorance. Now hear about this. O son of Bharata, according to one's existence under the various modes of nature, one evolves a particular type of faith. The living entity is said to be of, of a particular faith according to the modes he has acquired. Which means even your belief system, um, your shraddha or your worship here is influenced by the gunas. So what's the Lord saying? Men in the mode of goodness worship the demigods. Those in the mode of passion worship the demons. And those in the mode of ignorance worship ghosts and spirits. Those who undergo severe austerities and penances not recommended in the scriptures, performing them out of pride and egoism, who are impelled by lust and attachment, who are foolish and who torture the material elements of the body as well as the super soul dwelling within are to be known as demons. So we can think of examples of many um, personalities from scriptures who performed severe austerities and penances like Hiranyakashipu, Ravana, etc. Krishna does not want you to torture your body. Why? Because he is also residing in that body as Paramatma. So when he sees the Jivatma undoing self-torture, it pains him very much. So Krishna is saying those who go to the extremes of performing austerity, they are actually demoniac. Even the food each person prefers is of these three kinds according to the three modes of material nature. The same is true of sacrifices, austerities and charity. So Krishna has talked about faith, the kind of worship. Then he's talked about um, austerities. Now he's going to talk about sacrifices, charity and food. Now here are the distinctions between them. Fools dear to those in the mode, foods dear to those in the mode of goodness increase the duration of life. Purify one's existence. 
and give strength, health, happiness, and satisfaction. Such foods are juicy, fatty, wholesome, and pleasing to the heart. So essentially, these foods are considered to be vegetarian. Vegetarian food is in the mode of goodness. So such food will actually <clears throat> keep you in good health. Foods that are too bitter, too sour, salty, hot, pungent, dry, and burning are dear to those in the mode of passion. Such foods cause distress, misery, and disease. So too much of sour stuff, too much spicy food, too much of bitter food causes disease, causes distress, causes misery, Krishna says. Food prepared more than three hours before being eaten, food that is tasteless, decomposed, and putrid. This talks about animal flesh. And food consisting of remnants and untouchable things is dear to those <clears throat> in the mode of darkness. Food prepared more than three hours before being eaten. So as soon as the food is cooked, it automatically starts. Um, the decaying process begins. So food is meant to be plucked fresh, cooked fresh, and had fresh. Not cooked and kept days in the fridge or freezer and remove it and then reheat it and then consume it. Of course, this does not apply to prasadam. Bhoga that you offer to the Lord and honor as prasadam, it does not apply to that. Of sacrifices, the sacrifice performed according to the directions of scripture as a matter of duty by those who desire no reward is of the nature of goodness. <clears throat> Any yajna that we do, we should do it as a sense of duty, Krishna is saying. You shouldn't expect anything in return. If you are expecting something in return, then that sacrifice is actually being under the mode of passion. If you do it strictly as a matter of duty, then you're performing it in some but the sacrifice performed for some material benefit or for the sake of pride, O chief of the Bharatas, you should know to be in the mode of passion. Any sacrifice performed without regard for the directions of scripture, without distribution of prasadam, spiritual food, without chanting of Vedic hymns and remunerations to the priests, and without faith is considered to be in the mode of ignorance. Now, if we don't uh, pay the brahmanas nicely, and if you avoid paying the brahmanas, then the brahmanas who perform the sacrifice get the full credit of that sacrifice. And any yajna that you perform, you have to distribute prasadam. That's per Vedic scripture. So, if you're not following the scripture, then Krishna says, all of what you've done, you've just wasted time chanting of Vedic hymns, you've not paid the priest, you've not distributed prasadam, total waste. Actually, Krishna will say that at the end of this, in this chapter. So um, I'm not saying it, Krishna is saying it. Austerity of the body consists in worship of the Supreme Lord, the Brahmanas, the spiritual master, and superiors like the father and mother, and in cleanliness, simplicity, celibacy, and nonviolence. So again, the spiritual master is coming into the picture. Krishna is saying, what is the nice way of performing austerity of the body? Austerity of the body means you have to worship the Lord, you have to worship the Brahmanical class, you have to worship your parents, you have to worship your spiritual master, and you should also be clean, simple, practice celibacy and practice nonviolence. Austerity of speech consists in speaking words that are truthful, pleasing, beneficial and not agitating to others. And also in regularly reciting Vedic literature. <clears throat> and satisfaction, simplicity 
gravity, self-control, and purification of one's existence are the austerities of the mind. This threefold austerity, which is austerity of the body, austerity of speech, and then austerity of the mind. So the sannyasis, when they take the sannyasi oath, in Vaishnava culture, they, they are called Tridanda sannyasis because uh, the pole that they carry around has actually three poles. Technically four poles, but three poles, they are called Tridanda sannyasi. Why? Because they are dedicating their body, their mind and their speech to Krishna. So that is one of the sannyas vows. So imagine, even if you are a grihastha and you are performing austerity of the body, austerity of speech and austerity of the mind, well, Krishna considers you to be in the same category as the uh, yagis. This threefold austerity performed with transcendental faith by men, not expecting material benefits, but engaged only for the sake of the Supreme, is called austerity in goodness. So Krishna has talked about three kinds of austerities, body, mind and speech. So now Krishna is going to talk about penances. Penance performed out of pride and for the sake of gaining respect, honor and worship is said to be in the mode of passion. It is neither stable nor permanent. Penance performed out of foolishness with self-torture or to destroy or injure others is said to be in the mode of ignorance. <clears throat> Charity given out of, now Krishna has completed talking about penance. Now he's going to talk about charity. Charity given out of duty without expectation of return at the proper time and place and to a worthy person is considered to be in the mode of goodness. But charity performed with the expectation of some return or with a desire for fruitive results or in a grudging mood is said to be charity <clears throat> in the mode of passion. Any charity performed at an impure place, at an improper time, to unworthy persons or without proper attention and respect is said to be in the mode of ignorance. From the beginning of creation, the three words Om Tat Sat were used to indicate the supreme absolute truth. These three symbolic representations were used by Brahmanas while chanting the hymns of the Vedas and during sacrifices for the satisfaction of the supreme. Therefore, transcendentalists undertaking performances of sacrifice, charity and penance in accordance with scriptural regulations begin always with mm. Om to attain the Supreme. Without desiring fruit of results, one should perform various kinds of sacrifices, penance and charity with the word Tat. The purpose of such transcendental activities is to get free from material entanglement. The absolute truth is the objective of devotional sacrifice and it is indicated by the word Sat. So Krishna has described, oh, when is Om Tat Sat said? What are the indications of the three uh, words? The performer of such sacrifice is also called Sat as are all works of sacrifice, penance and charity, which true to the absolute nature are performed to please the Supreme Person, O Son of Pritha. Krishna is concluding by saying, actually all sacrifices, penances and austerities that we undertake should be done to please Him. What if it is not? Krishna says, anything done as a sacrifice, charity or penance without faith in the Supreme, O son of Pritha, is impermanent or asat. It is called asat 
and is useless both in this life and the next. So essentially, Krishna is saying there are so many jivatmas performing penances, sacrifices, charity, austerities. And if they are not doing it to please Krishna, they have simply wasted time. They will not get any results for it. So Krishna is saying such activities are called asat and is useless both in this life and the next. So it's quite a sobering thought to think how many austerities we may have performed in the past, but we didn't do it for the pleasure of Krishna. Well, we know what the Lord thinks. So now coming to the slides. <clears throat> so the question Arjuna is asking is, Ye Shastra Vidhim Mutsrijya Yajante Shraddha Yan Vitaha Tesham Nishtha Tuha Krishna Sattvam Maho Rajas Tamaha. So the divine are always going to follow the scriptures. The demoniac don't follow the scriptures. But in between the two, there are people who follow a little bit of something or a little bit of everything. So <clears throat> some of this may be based on tradition, what you follow. Some of it may be based on scriptures, what you follow. And some of it may be based on your own sentiment that you have developed. So that is actually um, Arjuna's question. So Krishna then elaborates the different characteristics and symptoms of such people, how the gunas actually influence everything that they do. So essentially Krishna is saying, if one does not follow the Vedas, what will you do? You'll follow your instincts. And your instincts are going to be influenced by the three gunas, Sattva Gun, Rajagun, and Tamu. So you can see in this picture, who's in Sattva Gun? Vibhishan. Who is in Rajogun? It's Ravana. Because Ra Ravana is chasing things, right? He wants something. Who is in Tamogun? Kumbhakarna is in Tamogun. So Krishna is going to talk about all of these different lifestyles we live based on the three modes and of course ultimately also the transcendental mode which is called Shuddha Sattva. So Krishna has talked about these topics related to the three gunas, faith and worship, food, sacrifice, their personal conduct, their speech, and whether they are able to control their mind, austerity of the mind, body, and speech. Yajante satvika devan yaksharaksham sirajasaha Pretan bhuta ganam schanye yajante tamasa janaha. So, this is different kinds of worship. So, generally, people in the Sattva Gun are worshipping demigods. So, what if you're worshipping Krishna or Lord Vishnu or Lord Narayana? Or what if you're worshipping everybody that's there in your puja room? Generally, in our puja rooms, we have pictures of everyone. We don't like the idea of not worshipping any of the demigods or any of the prominent demigods. So one day somebody asked a preacher, you know, because in Iskon we say you need to only worship Krishna or you can worship Lakshmi Narayana. But normally we worship Radha Krishna or Gauranitai, the um, Krishna Balaram in the Kali Yuga who came as Gauranitai. So typical question that will be asked is, you know, I've been worshipping such and such demigod for many years. How can I stop? Um, so the preacher said, well, there are 33 crore demigods. So you're not worshipping all 33 crore demigods. If you worship Lord Krishna, all the 33 crore demigods are automatically pleased by your worship of Krishna. 
So there's nothing that you need to worry about. But anyway, Krishna is saying, if you are in the Sattva Gun, you are you are uh, keen on worshipping the demigods. But at the same time, you're not fully following the scriptures. Right? Because this entire chapter about, is about those who fall in between the two extremes, the divine and the demoniac. So, Srila <clears throat> Prabhupada says that faith is based on our heart. Um, the subtle body the faith is subtle and abstract. So we can study the symptoms of a person and understand what influences that person's faith. Which mode of goodness influences that person's faith. So let's move forward with the next segment, which is the foods in the three modes. So wholesome, juicy, pleasing. And the result is you have a long life. It gives you strength. It keeps you free from disease. It makes you happy. It purifies you. Um, bitter, sour, hot, pungent, burning foods, they result in distress, disease, and misery. Um, foods that are too old, and foods that are decomposing or considered untouchable, they cause disease and shorten your lifespan. And they also cause a lot of infections. So Krishna is saying, be mindful of what you eat. But your eating habits are also dictated by the guna that you are being influenced on that. What is the best food? The best food, of course, is prashadam, which is in the shuddha sattva state. Prashadam means you have to offer everything that you cook to Krishna first. Let Krishna accept it and then you can honor it as prasadam. So just like you serve yourself in nice plate and nice bowls, similarly you should offer prasadam or bhoga to the Lord similarly arranged like this in different cups. Every item must have a tulsi leaf in it. Uh, before you offer it to the Lord. And after you offer it to Krishna, you take it out, add it to the rest of your cooked dish uh, in each of the pots, and the whole pot becomes prasada. Not just the one that you offered. Of course, the one that you offered is prasadam. The minute you mix it with the, the rest of the item in the cooking pots, the whole cook, cooked item becomes prasadam. So there is a um, you know, story of uh, austerities, which we'll look at shortly here. So sacrifices in the three modes. Krishna says, Vidhihinam asrishtanam mantrahinam adakshinam shraddha virahitam yagnyam tamasam parichakshaste Any sacrifice performed without regard for the directions of scripture without distribution of prasadam, without chanting of Vedic hymns and remunerations to the priests and without faith is considered to be in the mode of ignorance. Sacrifices in three modes. So any yajna that you perform has to be as per scripture, as a matter of duty and for no reward. It reminds me of a pastime with Srila Prabhupada. When Srila Prabhupada oversaw the construction of the temple in Vrindavan, um, he printed invitations to call all of the other um, uh, practicing faiths for the inauguration, including doing fire sacrifices. So the disciples of Prabhupada asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, but if you are a devotee of Krishna, chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra while the deities are being installed is also sufficient. Why do we need to do all this yajna, sacrifices, which are encouraged in the Vedas? Because, you know, it is said that we don't have to worry about doing all of this. So Prabhupada says, because we live in a society 
sometimes we have to honor what the rest of society wants. So Prabhupada's point was that this temple will not be accepted as a legitimate temple unless we follow the traditional processes involved in installing the deities for worship, involving the yajnas and the homas that need to be done as for the scriptures. So because we are living in a place where these things are expected, so sometimes we have to perform these things for the satisfaction of others. But Prabhupada says, otherwise, if we just do 24-hour Nama Sankirtan, the installation is proper and good. So <clears throat> if you perform sacrifices for the sake of reward or pride and honor, then you know you're doing it in the mode of passion. If you're not following the scriptures or you're trying to follow the scriptures while doing the yajna, but then half of the things you abandon because it's not convenient for you, you don't offer prasadam, there's no chanting of um, hymns, priests are not being paid, you just do some bogus yajna, then you know what Krishna says, all of that, it's a waste of time. What about our conduct? We respect and worship as a matter of duty. Um, but some of it we want it as for our own selfish interests. Then that means it's being performed in the mode of passion. Um, sometimes we do yajna because we want to be glorified as having performed this great yajna, as having sponsored this great yajna. Sometimes we engage in self-torture to get the power to destroy others. And in this regard, there is a story from Ramayana. There is a labor cross person called Shambhuka. Um, one day, Lord Ram was in his palace and there is a Brahmana who came and rang the bell. In those days, anybody could meet the king you had to ring the bell, announce yourself, and you were guided into the palace to have an audience with the king. So this Brahmana came with his dead son. And as we mentioned earlier, any death in the kingdom, the king has to accept the karma, especially untimely deaths. So the Brahmana has lost his son, and he has come to Lord Ram to tell him, how come I lost my son? You must not be a very dharmic king because if you were dharmic king, I would not have lost my son. So a little bit of a doubt was created. How come under the rule of Lord Ram, a Brahmana lost his child in an untimely way? So Lord Ram ponders this for some time and Narada Muni comes immediately to help the Lord. He tells Lord Ram, you know, there is a Shudra in your kingdom by the name Shambhuka who is doing a great deal of austerity. And he is the cause of the untimely death of this child. So Lord Ram knows what the next steps are. He needs to find this person and take care of him. So he meditates and the Pushpaka Vimana appears and the Lord steps onto the Pushpaka Vimana and goes in search of um, this Shambhuka. He comes to a place where Shambhuka is performing this severe austerity. He's hanging upside down on a tree and doing this intense penance. So Lord Ram asks, who are you? And the Shambhuka says, you know, I'm Shambhuka, I'm a Shudra. And Lord Ram asks, why are you doing this intense tapasya? And Shambhuka says, that's because I want to become the next Indra. I want to dislodge the Indra and take that position. I want to defeat him. I want to throw him out. I want to get married to his wife, Shachi Devi. 
Lord Ram doesn't wait to hear or ask any more questions. He just kills him immediately. So when Lord Ram comes back, the Brahmana's son regains his life. So Acharyas explain that what seems to be two completely unconnected activities, how fixing the adharmic activities can also resolve the adharmic results. Right? So tapas also has to be done as per the scriptures. One must not perform any austerities against scriptures. So as per scriptures, you can keep a fast on ekadesi, which is essentially once in a fortnight, there is a day in which you can fast. This fasting is, of course, beneficial for you. Other kind of fasts that people make up on their own, you know, I just decide to fast every Tuesday or every Thursday, something like that. Those are not considered to be as per Vedic scriptures. So that means you are keeping these fasts out of ignorance. Then Krishna talks about speech. Speech in the mode of goodness, it's truthful, it's pleasing, it's beneficial. Speech in the mode of, pa in the mode of passion is manipulative, involves gossip, and uh, is meant to satisfy the self alone. Speech in the mode of ignorance, it involves lying, things, saying things that are agitating to others, and saying things that are harmful to others. So there is a little story about a man um, who meets another man. Some misunderstanding happens between the two of them. And this man um, critiques him very harshly. And not only does that, but shares this criticism of him and accuses, accuses him of doing things. And he spreads this bad information about this other gentleman. Ultimately, he realizes that everything that he had said was untrue. And now he wants to do some tapas to make up for the bad things that he had said character assassination he had done of another person. So he goes in search of a holy man and he asks the holy man, you know, can you help me? I did this. How can I make up for the sin? You know. So the holy man says, take this pillow, take it into the town, cut it open and let all the feathers fly out. And this man was thinking, you know, what kind of activity is this and how is it actually going to benefit me? <clears throat> Nevertheless, he was a holy man, so he didn't question. He went out to the town, cut open the pillowcase and let all the feathers fly out into town. And he went back to the holy man and he asks, okay, I've done what you asked me to. Now what should I do? So the holy man says, now you go back into town with the pillowcase find all the feathers and put it back and bring every single one back to me. Now this man says, now come on, you're taking it too far. Obviously I cannot do that because all the feathers have blown away in the wind. How will I even locate them? How will I even find them? How will I capture them? And how will I put them back in the bag? There's no chance that this is possible. So the holy man said, similarly, Whatever words that you've already put out about the other man, there is no way you can take it back. You've already committed the sin of, uh, you know, using harsh words to describe another person. There's nothing you can do. Of course, our scriptures say you can go and beg for forgiveness from the person that you did it. But the problem is even if you beg for forgiveness, the, the bad mouthing has spread across town. 
how are you going to go inform everybody that what I said was not true? Because in modern day world, they say, you know, um, the marketing companies and many companies are worried about this. If one customer has a bad experience with you and they critique you publicly on your Facebook page or on Twitter, it the news spreads fast. And it impacts your company image and brand image. So a lot of companies are very worried about bad publicity. Whether it is legitimate or not doesn't matter. Once the customer has criticized the company or its product or its services, that spreads very, very fast. So, but if a customer gives you a good review, that doesn't spread too far and wide. You know? So therefore, Krishna is saying, we should be careful with our speech. Anything that we speak, not only must be truthful, but at the same time, that truth should be said in such a way that it is pleasing to the other person. It should be said in a such a way that it is beneficial. So there's a great philosopher by the name Socrates. One day a man came running to Socrates and said, I have some very, very important news to tell you. And Socrates said, first tell me, is what you're about to tell me truth? The man said, actually, I don't know. I'm not sure if it is truthful or not. Then Socrates asked, will what you're about to say be pleasing? And the man said, no. And then Socrates asked, is it beneficial to me for me to hear this? And Socrates said, and the man said, no. So Socrates told the man, then I don't need to hear whatever important information you wanted to pass on to me, but it didn't fit any of the three criteria. So a wise man never lends ear to useless information. So we should be very cautious about speech and we should also be very cautious about the kind of information that people feed you to manipulate you or to pass on gossip, etc. So in the mode of goodness, your mind is satisfied and content. In the mode of passion, Krishna says you are dissatisfied and you are always anxious. In the mode of ignorance, you are bewildered and illusioned. <clears throat> but if your mind is always dwelling on the scriptures, thinking of Krishna, then your mind has transcended these three gunas. So charity has to be performed out of duty with no expectations in return. It should be done at a proper time and place and it should be done to a worthy cause, a worthy person. If it isn't done in any other way, then you are doing it under the influence of passion or ignorance. So let us say, for example, um, you want to donate for Annadan. Um, normally, Annadan funds are given to temples because temples have, many temples have large enough kitchens where they can prepare prasadam in large quantities and distribute it to the needy so that they get prasadam. So if you're contributing to Annadan, you should make sure that what is served is what has been offered to Lord Krishna because that is then beneficial not just for you, but it also brings Sukriti to the person who receives and honors that prasadam. So when prasadam is served, two people benefit. Three people, I suppose. Or many, many more people, I suppose. The person who has sponsored it, the person who has cooked it, the person who is serving it, and the person who is honoring the prasadam. All of them get Sukriti. Sukriti means you get spiritual credit for it. Imagine, eating could be so beneficial to you, not just on the physical level, but it is also on the spiritual level you are accumulating spiritual credits every time you are honoring prasadam. 
Whereas if you give money to any other organization, that may do many things, you know. Um, they may be feeding the poor, they may be, um, you know, taking care of orphans, um, of widows, etc. But if they're not doing it in the mood to please Krishna, so although your intention was good, um, the outcome is that you are going to collect uh, pious credits for which you have to take birth again. But anyway, uh, if you're doing it out of Sattva Gun, then you will get Punya credits for it. That is, you'll do it to, at a proper time, at a proper place to a worthy person. So, when you are trying to save another person's body through your charity, then you are dwelling on the material realm. When your charity is utilized to serve not just a person's body, but also to nourish their soul, then that is the topmost charity that you can do. That kind of charity pleases Krishna. So even when you are looking at supporting good causes, take a closer look at the cause. And of course, Krishna says we should have no expectations in return. But at the same time, we should use our intelligence to know what is going to satisfy Krishna and do charity as per what Krishna desires. So anything, any funds that are used to please and serve the Lord and please and serve the Jivatma simultaneously is charity in the mode of Shuddha Sattva. So many people may say, you know, organizations like ISKCON and other traditional temples spend quite a lot of money on doing Abhishek, spend so much money on flowers, spend so much money on dressing the Lord, spend so much money on decorating the deities with beautiful jewelry. So many people object to that. But they are objecting to this out of sheer ignorance. They feel all of those funds would be better used to save the suffering souls. Why can't we physically use those funds to clothe the people who don't have clothes, to give shelter to those who don't have shelter, to um, give uh, the last funeral rites to those who have been, to the those bodies who that have been abandoned, um, to take care of the education of children. I'm sure many of you have people in your family that think like this, you know. Why waste many money on building temples? So these could be the type of questions that you face when you are asked about charity. Now let's look at it from a spiritual perspective. All of what we have just said now, they are worthy causes. But it, it relieves the person from an immediate suffering, but it doesn't care about that soul suffering. It is only focused on the body suffering. Very good. Even people who are suffering must receive um, adequate care, adequate guidance, adequate last rites, etc. It's important because nobody is going to be ready to practice spirituality when they are deep in the throes of such extreme suffering. But helping that other person should be done in such a way that in some way, shape or form, you are also connecting them to Krishna. If in some way, shape or form you are connecting them to Krishna, then that is a worthy charity. So let's take one more example. So let us say, I want to build a house for the orphans um, or for the homeless. I build 
you know, low cost housing. Now, if I have not offered the houses and performed yajna for the satisfaction of Krishna, then all I have done is accumulated some punya and also not given any benefit to the person receiving that house. So, for example, if I go back to the example of the Anadan, if you serve food that is not offered to Krishna, to someone else, not only you have to partake of the sin, they also have to partake of the sin. Because in the process of preparing food, we have to destroy fields, we destroy so many insects. In the process of transporting that food, the vehicles kill so many insects. And there may be also a lot of illegal activities happening in, the, in, in that whole chain, that whole supply chain. So we have to remember what Krishna tells us in chapter 3, that those who eat without offering it to me, verily eat only sin. So why would I want to give charity to an organization that prepares food, that nourishes the body, but also forces that jivatma to accept the sins because simply because that organization was ignorant of the shastras. Yes, they may be doing a good deed for themselves. But why would I want to bind another jivatma with more sins? So essentially that charity is being performed out of selfishness. You want to feel better about helping others and you feel satisfied that others are being helped. But they are being helped only on the bodily platform. But spiritually you've cursed them to take another birth because they have, ha they have accepted the sins of things being given to them that have not been offered to the Lord. So same thing if a housing or any clothes are being given. They should be offered to the Lord before they are offered in charity. Then, even though you may not have preached to that person to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, somehow or the other you have connected them to Krishna. Krishna says, anything that you offer me, I already reside in that offering. So the other person also benefits spiritually. Therefore, anything that we do, should always be done keeping the spiritual repercussions or the spiritual importance of what we are about to do. Then everything that you do is on the spiritual platform. Whereas here, the charity that you see outlined here, it's all on the material platform. That's why Krishna is saying, everything becomes asat. There's no use. Temporarily, you will feel good. Maybe you have accumulated some punya. But for that punya, you have to take birth. For whatever papa you have handed over to the other person, that person also has to take birth. So like this, this vicious cycle carries on. Krishna says, Datavyam iti yadanam diyate nupakarine deshe desha kale cha patre cha taddanam satvikam smritam so, at a minimum, Krishna says, do charity out of duty. Don't expect anything in return. Do it at the proper time and place and do it to a worthy person. Then you're doing it in the mode of goodness. The same thing you add Krishna to the picture and it becomes the mode of transcendence. So, what's the best charity? Any charity that is done with the mood of pleasing Krishna and then distributing the remnants to all, then you are benefiting many, many souls on a spiritual platform. So yes, the poor need to be served. The best thing you can do is cook nice items in the temple, offer it to Jagannath, and then distribute it as prasadam to those who need it. <clears throat> then they are nourished both on a physical platform and also on a spiritual platform. 
Krishna says, ultimately, I am the enjoyer. But if you operate outside scriptures and do anything without any faith, then it is useless. Ashraddhaya hutam dattam tapas taptam kritam chayat asad ityuchyate partha nachatat pretya no iha. Anything done as a sacrifice, charity, or penance without faith in the Supreme, O son of Pratha, is impermanent. It is called asat and is useless both in this life and next life. That means something else must be true of charity. So this is a verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, Chapter 3, Verse Number 23. Sattvam vishuddham vasudeva sabditam yadiyate tatra pumana pavrataha sattve chatasmin bhagavan vasudevo hyadoksha jome namasa vidhiyate I am always engaged in offering obeisances to Lord Vasudeva in pure consciousness. Krishna consciousness is always pure consciousness in which the Supreme Personality of Godhead known as Vasudeva is revealed without any covering. So let's go back to the shloka in chapter 14 where the Lord says, Mam chayo vyabhicharena bhakti yogena sevate Sagunan samati tyaitan brahma bhuyaya kalpate. Krishna says, one who engages in full devotional service, unfailing in all circumstances, at once transcends the modes of material nature and thus comes to the level of Brahman. So what is the Shuddha Sattva? As soon as one is fully Krishna conscious, it is to be understood that one is in his pure, original, constitutional position. The state of existence is called Shuddha Sattva, which means that it is transcendental to the material qualities. So today's chapter, the acronym was FACE. We began with faith in the three different modes, all kinds of austerities being performed under the three modes, including speech, and uh, mind, sacrifices, conduct, etc. We looked at charity being performed in the three modes, how Krishna is the enjoyer of everything, what is the Shuddha Sattva state, we should do everything in pure devotion, this is what the Lord has said. So the single word summary for today's chapter is key. The key to acquiring these divine qualities is to do everything with faith. Therefore, all yagnyas, all tapas, all sacrifices, all austerities that you do, all charities that you do must be done with faith and must be done as per the scriptures, Krishna says. Therefore, all your sacrifices that you do are prefixed or end with the words Om Tat Sat, meaning you're literally saying you're doing this for the pleasure of the Lord. And if you do that, Krishna says, you are performing pure devotion services. So tomorrow's chapter is the last chapter. Tomorrow's chapter is called Moksha Sanyasa Yoga. The chapter begins with Arjuna asking an interesting question. A question he has asked before, but Arjuna is seeking a little bit more clarity. So Krishna will answer Arjuna's question and then Krishna will summarize the entire Bhagavad Gita in the sequence with which he has spoken important shlokas that will be um, rather important concepts that Krishna will repeat. Therefore, this chapter is the longest chapter in the Bhagavad Gita. It has 78 shlokas and it's the concluding chapter 
It's called the perfection of renunciation. So Arjuna's question is, is it better to renounce or is it better to be a renunciate? Who is better? A person who gives up everything or a person who gives up, uses everything in the service of Krishna? And Krishna will say, both are superior. But in my mind, the person who uses everything in my service is topmost. So the difference between a tyagi and a sannyasi, that's the question Arjuna asks. So join us tomorrow to learn all about surrender, which will be the conclusion of the 18th chapter. We'll get into a little bit more examples in the 17th chapter also tomorrow before we begin the 18th chapter. So we look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. One chakal padarupya stripapasundu be evacha patitanam pavane pyo vaishnavi pyo monamaha anantakoti vaishnavu vrindaki jai jagat guru shila propadi ki jai shila gurudev ki jai shishi gauranatai ki jai. Thank you everybody. Hare